Justin Gagey is a monster. Baby sunshine and baby Justin Gaethje often says his road to the UFC began at age four, but Gaethje was born a twin, and by the sound of things, they were scrapping from the get-go. I'd say those two were grappling inside the womb. Justin was probably born with cauliflower ears, umbilical cords all tangled up like a couple iPhone cables. Most violent baby in a hospital. I may be exaggerating here a little, but by all accounts, they were a handful. We definitely fought a lot. I know we gave my parents a lot of headaches. We've had couches broken, beds broken. I can't tell you how many things were broken in our house. We played football in the house, you know, we would just, you know, just tear that house apart. And I was down on the floor, of course, playing football with Marcus and Justin. One of them was going for the pass and I threw him the ball and caught it. The other one tackled one right into the pot and just dropped and shattered. And about then the babysitter walked in. I was like, sorry, but I gotta go to work. That's a clip from a short documentary SB Nation did, and they even managed to catch Justin's mother retelling the heartwarming moment when she was told she was having twins. I mean, this is just beautiful. I went to the doctor and he told me that he thought he heard two heartbeats, and I'm like, oh, please no. Oh, Jesus Christ, doctor, say it ain't so. <laughs> uh, that's good. Justin's energy was quickly channeled into sports football, baseball, but his biggest passion right off the bat was wrestling. He was an exceptional high school wrestler and won state championships both as a junior and a senior. Finishing high school, many kids in Justin's hometown, Safford, Arizona, might not have felt like they had many career options. Safford is a small mining town and mining runs deep in Justin's family. In fact, the whole town seems to revolve around and depend upon the mine. Most of the people are tied to the copper mine in one way or another. My dad's been working there 30 years. Both of my grandpas, they retired from there. My brother works there, all my uncles, my cousins. The mine is everything for us. If that mine were to somehow really tank, it would impact everything from this school, our supermarkets. I mean, we're all you know reliant on, on the mine for our economy. So for many kids, the mine is the most obvious option. Good money, secure job, but hard work and long hours. After high school, Justin had a three-month stint working in the mine. 12-hour days. One week, he did 96 hours. In three months, he took one day off because he needed to sleep. Now, what can you even say about that? Lazy son of a bitch. Taking days off to lay around sleeping in bed. Pure, utter laziness. Now, I mean, I would call that an ordeal. 96 hours in a mine. I'd say I'd last about... 96 seconds maybe but one thing it taught him is that it just wasn't for him he worked for a full summer made some good money and and realized that he never wanted to do it again i believe <laughs> luckily justin's high school accomplishments gave him an opportunity to wrestle for northern colorado while pursuing a human services degree he became the university's first division one all-american and as a junior he finished seventh in the ncaa championships so an extremely accomplished wrestler. In his final year, his grades were slipping, and he made a deal with the assistant coach that if he got his shit together in terms of grades, he would get Justin an amateur MMA fight. Justin went 5-0 as an amateur, and did so without any training. With a pro debut as the next logical step in his career, Justin felt that it might actually be time to find an MMA coach. You know, get some striking going. Like I said, it's all godsend because, you know, there's no reason, there's no rhyme or reason why I walked into the grudge. It could have been any, anywhere and I wouldn't be where I'm at today, so I'm thankful for that. So it was pretty much an accident? Uh, not an accident, it was uh, a yeah. fate, I guess. You okay. Call it. okay. Yeah, but yeah, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> a very lucky accident because grudge head coach Trevor Whitman has been the architect of Justin's evolution. By the time of that interview, Justin was already the undefeated lightweight champion of World Series of Fighting. He was building a career brutalizing opponents with relentless pressure and a diverse striking game. Head kicks, knees, thunderous punches, whatever the fuck this is, but probably most notably of all, fight-ending leg kicks. Conspicuously absent from his MMA game was wrestling, which he regarded as boring. 
Hey, well, all these wrestlers are tarnishing my sport. They need to quit doing that boring crap. So I'm here to show you how it's done. I'm going to come forward, and I'm only here to knock people out. I'm not here to submit nobody. Are we going to see you go for a takedown and ground and pound? <laughs> hey, boss. One thing, man, I'm never going to do that. I'm, I'm here for one reason. Like I said, this is a whole different sport for me. This is fighting. Probably the two most notable fights of his World Series career were against a little-known Peruvian fighter, Luis Palomino. They just beat the living shit out of each other. The fights were as good as any you'll ever see. Ridiculous. Back and forth wars where both men were badly, badly hurt. These bouts added to Justin's growing reputation as a murderous, must-see TV madman. But while Gaethje might have won both fights, he went through hell to get there. And against a relatively unknown fighter. So even at this stage, people were starting to voice concerns about longevity and how he'd fare against the upper echelon of fighters in the far deeper UFC. There's just no way he can continue with this style against increasingly difficult opposition and avoid not only losses, but taking huge, potentially life-altering damage in the process. Justin defended his belt a total of five times in World Series of Fighting, remaining undefeated in his pro career, and now decided it was time to test free agency. When it came time to negotiate with the UFC, he was an accomplished champion in a solid organization with an incredible highlight reel, the combination of which allowed him to demand a serious purse right off the bat. For his first fight in the UFC, he was getting 100 a show, 100 a win, and that fight was against Michael Johnson. Johnson took exception to all the hype. You've been fighting tomato cans, but this is a UFC, and you're just not going to be able to... Michael also came out with one of the funnier comebacks I can remember, when Gaethje laid out his prediction for the fight. But Gaethje's prediction was on the money. His UFC debut was sensational. He got rocked right away, and the fight was a glorious back-and-forth brawl. Gaethje was badly hurt twice, but on both occasions he weathered the storm, continued moving forward wearing his opponent out. And true to his words, he dragged Johnson in them deep waters where he eventually drowned his ass. Gaethje's UFC debut was the 2017 Fight of the Year. You could not make a better introduction to the organization. And he collected two bonuses in the process, both fight and performance of the night. So he got off to a pretty good start. And he immediately set his sights on the upper echelons of the division. Whoever gets me closer to an interim title right now. You know, McGregor's not here, so I'm going to get that interim title on my waist, and when he comes back, pressure. It's been pointed out to me that he tweeted tonight about my fight. Uh, real recognize real. That dude's, a, that dude's a warrior. I'm a warrior. If I get the interim belt around my waist, I only got to do that two, two, maybe one or two more times, and then, like I said, I'm not going to ask for the money fight. I'm going to be the money fight. His next two fights were against Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier. And this is where those early concerns about the effectiveness and intelligence of using Gaethje's style against elite opposition were actually proven correct. Eddie Alvarez loosened the bolts, and in the fight of the fucking year against Poirier, the wheels finally came off once and for all. Justin had fought the same relentless style his entire career, and it had served him incredibly well. He made a name for himself in World Series of Fighting, he came to the UFC with some bargaining power. He picked up four bonuses in his first three fights. But the wheels had finally come off. Came to the UFC undefeated, was on the heels of back-to-back -back KO losses. Justin had finally reached his ceiling with that style. He was at a definite crossroads. Evolve and continue to rise, or stagnate and become at best a super entertaining, high-level gatekeeper. And it really wasn't obvious which way he'd go. Gaethje always spoke about his style being about excitement, career progression, and bonuses, which would make it sound like a conscious decision. I'm an entertainer. Uh, that's proven because I got performance and knock out of the night. Um, that's what I'm in there for. I'm here to make money, make a living. This is my job now. You know, I fight for bonuses. Um, my first well, 16 fights, I would have got an extra 50000 if it was on the line every single time. Um, that's what I fight for. But when pressed on it, he also said he couldn't change his style if he wanted to. That's just who he was inside the octagon. A man with an insatiable appetite for destruction. You know, I, I can't change the way I fight. 
I, it's impossible for me. It is who I am, and it's how I will fight every single time I go in there. Gaethje almost seemed trapped by his own reputation as the most exciting or violent man in the sport. Kill or be killed every single time. I mean, he celebrated the Alvarez loss almost like it was a victory. And I really had a lot of fun in there. That's, you know, it was a dream come true for me. If I lost, I, was, I hoped that it, I would got knocked out. And, uh, you know, all those things came true. I'm happy. I'm happy for myself. I'm happy for my family. Um, you know. Is it possible that you derived as much pleasure out of that kind of fight as you would a win, like the Michael Johnson fight? Is it the same kind of thing for you? It, it, it's close. Uh, it, it's really close, actually. I mean... And coming out of the Poirier fight, he made it sound like entertainment takes precedence over the actual result. You know, I, I didn't get in the sport to win or lose. I, I, it's an entertainment factor for me, and I will be known as and remembered as one of the most entertaining fighters that ever did it. Content with what just happened, as stupid and crazy as that sounds, you know, I felt so comfortable in there, so good. The best I've ever felt. And so here he is, on the heels of two losses. The holes have been exposed, the wheels have come off. And there's plenty of things suggesting that this guy might not be capable of adapting. He loves pleasing the fans. He didn't think he could change. And he seemed content to lose as long as it was in an exciting fashion. So you could easily be forgiven for thinking this guy's reached his limit. We found his ceiling. Nothing's gonna change here. And that's exactly how his next opponent saw things. He was regarding Gaethje as a joke. After two knockout losses in two brawls, he was calling him the Homer Simpson of MMA. Yeah, thank you, man. It's your last main event. You're about to be uh, on a three-fight losing streak and, and shipping your ass back to the B-League to fight tomato cans again. I got more money than you right now, bro. I, I fought four times in the last year, and I won my fights. You, you lost two out of three. You fucking suck, dude. I've been are you going to run like a bitch the whole time, or are you going to stand there and fight me? Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not the Homer Simpson of, bar, of MMA like you are, bro. I'm not going to take a beating, but you will get knocked the fuck out. You take you take 10 significant strikes per minute. That's 50 shots a round that you're, you, ain't lasting, you ain't lasting three rounds of me <laughs> taking all that beating like that. One thing Gaethje said before the fight was that Poirier and Alvarez might have beaten him, but James Vick doesn't have the footwork or angles of either guy. And that turned out to be prophetic vicious knockout. In his next fight, he demolished Barboza and then smashed the fuck out of Cowboy Cerrone. Even though none of those fights made it out of the first round, we did see enough to know that Justin had definitely evolved. Three sensational first round finishes. He was knocking his opponents out quicker while throwing far less punches and absorbing far less damage. He was simply a much more efficient and effective fighter and one who looked ready for a title shot. He attributed this transformation to finally heeding the longtime advice of Trevor Whitman. It's really the output. My output has dropped about 85%. My coach told me forever, try a little bit less and you will find more success. And it just was, it's like golf. It's like the harder you try, the worse you do. It doesn't make sense to me because my whole life in wrestling was the harder you work, you know, the, the better you did. Luckily, I have the 2018 coach of the year, um, the coach of the century. So I listen to everything he says. At the end of 2019, he began a little beef with McGregor. And it was actually informative. Up to this point, they had been mostly complimentary of each other. Conor praised his debut, while Gaethje often spoke positively of him. But while McGregor was going through his scumbag phase, Gaethje was one of his harshest critics. When Conor called for a Khabib rematch, Justin interjected with the following tweet. You're a tool. You have lost everything already. You're a shit human, father, and husband. Fuck you. Now that is scorched earth. Shit father and husband? Jesus. McGregor would eventually respond with exactly what you'd expect. Take an extreme offense at Justin's critique of his performance as a father. But this little spat perfectly illustrated one of Gaethje's major values in life. Throughout his career, Gaethje has often expressed his gratitude and admiration for his parents, who he views as having had an absolutely essential hand in his success. Again, you, you're, you're, your parents are your heroes, and thank God I was blessed with the best parents that, uh, that, I've, that I've ever come across. Um, my dad, 37 years, or 35 years, seven months in the copper mine working shift work. 
He had to drive an hour back and forth every single time he went to work. My mom is a postmaster. She uh, worked for the government and she's been there for close to 30 years now. Both of my parents have shown me what hard work and uh, staying true to yourself can get you. Um, um, winning or losing does not, does not matter to me or my parents. How I represent myself and represent my family is more important and will always be more important to me. So Gaethje feels your parents are your heroes and kids take a lot from them. But he also contrasted his own situation with that of a friend who came from a more disadvantaged background. The message he took from that guy's situation was about the importance of solid role models and positive influences in a child's life. My best friend in college was, uh, you know, he came from very opposite circumstances as I did. I have, I'm so blessed with the parents that I was was blessed with. And he, he came from the opposite, but it just took one or two positive influences in his life to steer him in the right direction. And now he works in the inner city in Denver. Um, most of his kids don't speak English and he's such a good influence and role model to these guys. And you know, there's no reason he should be that, but, but because one or two positive influences in his life, so. Gaethje also often speaks about wanting to use his human services degree to help at-risk youth. I went to school, I got a human services degree. It was for social work. I mean, that was, you know, and social work is listening. Um, you don't talk, you don't advise, you listen. You listen to people's problems. You don't try to intervene or, or steer a conversation. You, you're you steering a conversation, you're trying to keep a conversation going, but it's really about listening and trying to understand what you're, what you're hearing. If I could talk to 100 and affect one, you know, really, uh, I think um, I'm doing what I was set to do with this avenue that I was given. Yes, it's a violent sport. Yes, I'm trying to beat somebody up, but I'm really trying to inspire the youth uh, and inspire people that don't believe in themselves or maybe might be question their work ethic, you know, like. When Justin got to the UFC, he mentioned that he's just a kid from a small town with nothing to lose. Along similar lines, in another clip, he mentioned that growing up, many kids from Safford wouldn't have been able to see any clear alternative to working in a mine. I'm from a very, very small town. Where I'm from, you know, you you can't really open your eyes unless you unless you leave. There's a big world out there, and where I'm from is not big. <clears throat> you know, usually you work for the copper mine, which is very noble, very stable. So, a big part of what Justin sees as his purpose in life is inspiring those kids, letting them know that there's a big world out there, and there's a lot you can do with your life if you just work hard enough. So we've seen him exalt role models, pedestalize his own parents, and repeatedly talk about his own desire to help and inspire at-risk youth. You honestly get a sense that he feels being a positive role model is just about the most honorable thing you could do in your life. It's an idea he takes very seriously. It's central to a number of his talking points. And so you can see why Gaethje was so hostile towards McGregor. That whole part of Connor's life was the ugly antithesis of everything Gaethje respects and strives to embody. Facts are facts. I mean, you cannot represent yourself in the public eye like that and expect your child to respect what you do. You know, you are an influence. You are a hero to your children. And you are a fool if you think that they are not going to follow in your footsteps. But that was all a distraction. And shortly afterwards, Gaethje was kind of in limbo. Tony was fighting Khabib, Conor was focused on the winner of that. So in terms of fights that made sense, Justin was at a bit of a loose end. No, this is the name of the game. There's a, there's a lot, it's you know, a whole lot of nothing and then, a, then action and then back to nothing. It's very hard to stay focused, but ultimately I know I'm going to have a fight and I know it's going to be a big fight, so. Good prediction by Gaethje, because as we know by now, you know, I'm actually starting to wonder if the UFC hadn't booked Tony versus Khabib for the fifth time, would there have even been a pandemic? Like if the UFC tried to book it again, next time it'll probably be canceled because of a plague of locusts. Then there'll be a great flood, followed by pestilence of livestock, whatever the fuck that is, and so on, etc. It's just ridiculous. Long story short, Khabib gets trapped in Russia. And with less than three weeks to go, Gaethje gets offered a fight. And uh, I feel uh, I feel like there's seven point something billion people on earth and not one person is in my position right now. And I love it. My family, they all get, uh, they're all super nervous, super excited. Everyone totally believes in me, um, brings me comfort. I know what I have in front of me. Tony Ferguson is a, he lives in dark places. He's going to take me to a dark place. Now, this was an uncharacteristic decision by Gaethje. 
Throughout his career, he's always said he's against taking short notice fights. And not because of being physically unprepared, but more so of being mentally unprepared, having doubts. He's said many times that he gets his confidence gradually over the course of a punishing camp. If he can look back and see he did everything right, didn't cut any corners, then he knows he's at his best. That's what gave him the confidence to fight in the manner in which he did. Every single day I do not cheat, I do not. I wake up with, with a goal in mind and it's just to be better than yesterday. Um, you know, and the more days you could do that in a row, the, the more pre prepared you will be. Confidence is huge in there and if you, if you aren't prepared, then you, you can't be confident or as confident as you should be. Fortunately for him, the April date was cancelled after Gavin Newsom leaned on Disney to scrap the event. In the meantime, Gaethje relaxed, took it easy, you know, done a little social distancing, while Tony Ferguson actually made weight on the original date. The fight was later rescheduled for May 9th. This was announced three weeks ahead of the card, which gave Gaethje a total of five weeks to prepare. And that's a much more reasonable time frame to get ready for someone like Tony. This was a dream matchup. It might not have been as anticipated as Khabib Tony, but it was a guaranteed spectacle. Yeah, this is everything. Um, this, you know, I'm fighting for my life. Um, for everything that I've worked for in my life, this is this is the culmination of events that lead that has led me to here. This was certainly the toughest fight of Gaethje's career. Tony Ferguson, a fellow crowd jewel. Tony Ferguson had taken a hellacious and surprisingly one-sided, but more importantly than that, he had snapped one of the most impressive win streaks in lightweight history. Tony Ferguson had won 12 in a row, but Justin Gaethje was that unlucky number 13. In the post-fight, he basically thanked the people he'd been thanking his entire career. Best of luck to you in that title unification bout. We look forward to seeing you yeah, back in there. One more thing. Yeah. So um, this is the first fight my mom and dad have ever missed. All the credit goes to them. They've, they've made me who I am, and that's by leading by example, and I can't tell them how thankful I am for, uh, for the people they are and for the way they raised me. He's coached many champions. You know, I was his 18th. He's a genius, you know? I'll say it a thousand times. He's an artist and I'm a canvas, so. He also humbly admitted that the two way cuts of Ferguson may have diminished his performance, which I thought was a pretty impressive admission. He did it twice in less than a month. Do you think that that affected his performance in any way, shape, or form tonight? I can't say, but I do believe it would affect my performance if I did that. And finally, he reveled in the idea of having just set an example for those kids who might not see life's potential. Man, like I said, it feels so good. I just, I know how many people I just made feel, you know, happiness, gratefulness to be part of this journey. I'm grateful to have them. But these kids need to understand that you can do whatever you want as long as you work hard. And that's all I've done since I was four. I've worked hard and I've listened. At UFC 249, Justin won two things that he had been chasing since he got into the UFC. The first was money. He was always clear about that. And now as a holder of a belt, he'll be getting them tasty pay-per-view points. The other, though, was the opportunity to demolish Khabib's perfect record. Gaethje had always been overwhelmingly complimentary of Khabib. He constantly refers to him as the best in the world and has in the past admitted he doesn't know if he can beat Khabib. But he does believe he presents some tough problems for the champ. Who is the fight between you and Khabib? No idea. <laughs> I don't know. You sort of alluded I'd be, uh, you know, he probably beats me if you put it on paper, but man, I hit so hard and I kick so hard and I'm so, so athletic. The way you stop a takedown in wrestling is to meet force with force. You know, if he's going to take me down, it's going to be in the middle, and he's going to get his leg kicked a few times before he even gets a shot off. He also relishes the idea of representing America against Russia and Dagestan. We're fighting for the right to represent the United States of America against Russia's best. I believe it's hard for uh, the United States to get behind one fighter because we're such a melting pot and we're from so many places. But I believe that I could possibly bring us together and you know go to war with the United States behind me, and that's huge. But on top of all that, Gaethje had hoped Khabib would remain undefeated so that he would have the opportunity to snap one of the greatest streaks in the history of the sport. <laughs> Just to be, yeah. So it, it's your end. As long as he's undefeated. Even if he's not, I would want to fight him, but I want to fight him when he's undefeated. Well, Khabib has done exactly that. 
continued to mash people up, gradually snuff the fight out of them, and without fail get his hand raised. This is exactly what Justin wanted, and this is exactly what he's got. Having just snapped one epic win streak, Gaethje now has the opportunity to snap another and rack up one of the best back-to-back -back wins we've ever seen. It's a tall order, he's got a mountain in front of him. But one thing's for sure, the most violent motherfucker in this sport, he ain't going down without a fight. <laughs> This was a sponsored video, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this. It was sponsored by a new MMA channel called Jesse on Fire. Now, this guy is a character. I mean, he's hilarious. Uh, regular uploads, great content, and I am more than happy to recommend this channel. This clip cracked me up, man. Here's the deal. I have a theory. I think that Connor has someone else managing his Twitter. I think that the majority of the things that you see on his Twitter are not him. That could be me wishful thinking because I can't connect the person I see on camera, the clever genius that I see when he is actually on camera and whoever is Twitter fingers on his Twitter, okay? Now, I can almost tell you when it is him and when it's not him, right? Like, cause obviously he has access to his own Twitter, but he probably has someone else managing it. And he probably is like, yeah, say whatever you want. I don't care. I've already won. Just keep me relevant. Keep me in the conversation. I don't want to have to deal with Twitter, okay? Like, I wouldn't want to deal with Twitter. Yeah, keep me in the conversation. That's fine. As long, All that matters to me is that when I go on, you know, MMA Weekly or MMA Junkie or I watch these videos that people are talking about me. That's the only thing that matters, okay? So say whatever you want. I don't care. Because... I can tell you right now that he definitely wrote the one that said, I'm going to take your teeth and put them on a necklace. That's Connor for sure. That was Connor. But goat thread, here's what I think about who's the goat. That does not sound like Connor to me. That, like, that just sounds like, that sounds like someone else trying to sound like Connor. Goat thread. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like an Instagram, a thirsty Instagram model that's like, look at me. Goat thread. Like I read that, that's, that is literally the voice that I hear in my head when I look at that shit, okay? Like when I read, fucking put your teeth on a necklace, which we all know is my favorite sentence ever, that reads like that fucking crazy, clever Irishman who I love, right? Like that's, that is that. Goat thread, goat thread. It sounds pathetic, okay? It sounds fucking pathetic to me. I'm the goat and here's why. Shut up, okay? Whoever you are that's doing Connor's Twitter, you sound like an idiot, okay? You sound like a pussy. You sound like you're trying to sound like Connor, but you're actually a completely fake Connor who doesn't understand what it's like to actually be confident. I'm trying to sound confident like Connor. That's what the Twitter sounds like to me. Sure, I'll fight Anderson Silva, and I'll fight anybody. I'll fight Kamara Usman. I'll fight this person. I'll, I'll accept any challenger. That's what his fucking Twitter sounds like to me. It's like... Shut the fuck up, fake Connor. Whoever has Connor's Twitter. It's not, it can't be him, dude. It cannot be him. He can't be so in tune in real life with what the fuck is going on. And then his brain melts on fucking Twitter and all of a sudden he's this little like, like fake commie retard. I don't believe it's him, okay? I do not believe it's him. That's my new theory.